Hello again. Um, I am honored to be joined by Megan Smith, who is the CTO of the White House. And US. Uh, the US. Yeah. Yes. So welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, so since, uh, since you've been on the job, I guess it's been, what, about eight months now? Yeah, September. So. September. Yeah. Uh, what has surprised you the most? That you, weren't, you, you that you weren't expecting coming from, from, from the private sector. What has surprised you the most? I guess there's a couple things. Uh, one thing that's awesome is uh, it's been so impressive to learn all the things these guys have done, have done um, and learn just how, how government works. And just the accomplishments are extraordinary. Uh, I actually think that healthcare.gov, despite the website, <laughs> and now the website's good, is now with 16 million Americans, like nine out of 10 people is like breathtaking. You know, and, and some of the policies, that, the work to end veteran homelessness, the work to kind of get the long-term unemployed back in, the work on sort of Jeff Science and the economic, National Economic Council around jobs, around infrastructure, around, like everywhere around, people are executing extraordinary plays. And so that, that's been, fun and uh, encouraging and actually really extraordinary to learn and the talent level's high. And then I, what I see is, you know, coming from sort of that tech and innovation, all these ways to add to things they're doing, just enhance and add and, and really come into that, which is kind of what we're up to in a lot of ways. So that's been great. Um, you know, so you, you came over from Google where you were in, you know, obviously the private sector and you were able to kind of be more insulated and, and could do things in private. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. it's a public company, but you could do things in private. Now that your role is, is very public and, and there's a lot of transparency going on, has that changed anything with the way you work and, and, and how you do things? Um, I don't know. It's refreshing. Like anything we do, I always tell people, if you email me, you just assume it's on the web. Like just <laughs> everything, you know, as it should be. And uh, actually, Corey Zarek, who... It happens to be we're in the museum, so she's a, a First Amendment lawyer and teaches First Amendment law. She's also in the Team CTO, and she's the open, open government lead. Just, you know, the honor to work on that and really try to open up more uh, of uh, the government data, not only to build the data itself to build on top of it. You know, everything, I got to work on so much mapping. Right. When I was at Google, I did the acquisitions for Earth and Maps and worked with those extraordinary teams, and they sit on top of you know, the, the GIS data that, that this government and other governments have released, or if you think about the weather industry, you know, billions of dollar industry on top of fabulous data. So what, what else can we get out there? The president's released about 130,000 data sets uh, since he began through just kind of executive orders and then a lot of best practice work uh, from colleagues, especially at the GSA with data.gov, supporting the teams to release that and then getting that in central repository and getting that out, building developer communities. Lots of great work from there. But I, I think it's, uh, I love the direction we're going with open government and collaborative government. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it's exciting to see how government can move. Civic tech comes into more of the Wikipedia ways, which is how can government be more of a platform on which extraordinarily heroic talent can do its thing? for each other and for other people, whether it's uh, um, civic-minded folks, more of a, a nonprofit sector using that, that data and that, those tools, um, lifting poverty, et cetera, whether it's a more, more commercial interest, et cetera, sort of all dimensions. Um, how, how, how are you able to kind of, I guess, balance that openness and, and sharing more of that data with the things that don't need to be as, as open um, and, and in you, when it comes to areas of security? <coughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. You know. Um, I think there's a couple things. One, one is probably most things need to be open. Right. Uh, and so the more we can think about talent that's outside of government, collaborating with government, and, and be able to move into these new spaces. We work collaboratively with a lot of governments, uh, other governments and colleagues. And you know, we often look to the UK, who has the government digital service, much like the architecture of our now US digital service that Mikey Dickerson is running. Um, you know, the, the structures that they have and the openness, so open source, you know, and cross sharing, whether it's at a local level with the Code for America like plays, sure. or whether it's a national or international level, there's a, a new art called the D5, which is the most digital governments. It's UK, Estonia, Israel, um, uh, South Korea, and New Zealand. And we're working on that. A couple others will join that. Countries who have deep open source policies and are putting all their analytics online, you can go to analytics.usa.gov right now and see what are the top 20 websites the Americans think and use right this minute. Uh, and you can see how many Americans are on our websites. So those practices that every government should have, certainly in uh, cross-sharing best practices confidentially around cyber threats and that 
is a good thing to be doing, as well as really sunlighting certain things where colleagues uh, all around the world could be collaborating to, to fight those threats. So it's, it's sort of a mix of open and confidential. With so much of you know digital obviously increasingly becoming mobile, where do you see you know the the government's role in, in getting making sure that more of this data is accessible and mobily and, mm -hmm. and and is ready for kind of a mobile first world? Yeah, very like that's how we oh, everybody's doing that now. We should assume mobile uh, yeah. and everything. Uh, and in fact, there's much better access. Uh, there's so many Americans who are not online still, right. and they may they have some mobile access phone, through right. mobile, so we have to be think that way. The most significant thing that I guess we're upgrading and, and the president's leading this is, if you think about the people who are in government and who always have been here, um, it would be typical or normal if you were a lawyer. Sure. that you might spend some time in government, either clerking in a judicial world or coming in and out. If you were an economist, you would come in and out. If you were a scientist, you might do a AAAS fellowship. You might be in uh, any of our agency, NSF or NIH. Uh, if you are medical, again, NIH or CDC, uh, almost every talent, uh, great writers, speech writers, uh, communicators, that whole set, set of folks, uh, great operators. Um, you know, Secretary Jewell ran REI, now she's running Department of Interior. Uh, you see that, and yet in tech, there's not a rotation. There's not a standard thing that the techies come um, at scale in this way. They're often not in the leadership position. They're kind of working for everyone they're buried in, so that tech talent doesn't come up. So we call it TQ, like IQ and EQ. So how are we using new structures like the U.S. Digital Service, uh, Presidential Innovation Fellows, and others to bring technical people to the table? Our, our CTO team is like that. Um, and making sure that the techies and the innovation style with which we work is here in government at the, at the main policy tables, just like the economists or the judicial or other would be there. And that's, that's a big shift because we had tended to have everyone would decide what to build, and then we'd ask some other, we'd write a big document, ask some people to build right. it, very talented people, but the disconnect was causing a lot of dysfunction and a lot of uh, cost problems. And so now by having a few of the techies at the table as you're architecting and designing things, it really changes what we're capable of like thinking through as a cross-functional team of what we could achieve, what we're capable of asking for, and what we're doing in terms of protecting the American people and not overspending on tech. And we also find extraordinary techies who are buried within government. We can surface them you know, into these conversations, and they can lead just like their other colleagues in other sectors. You know, you talk about that and you say, you know, it's hard to kind of sometimes, you know, do your, your, your tour, you know, to come in and, and out from, from the tech field. Obviously, individuals like yourself are doing that where they're coming from the, from the private sector and, mm -hmm. and working in government. How can we get more people to do that, especially more, you know, really innovative and, and excited technologists um, or even people who are just starting out? How can we get them more interested in, in working with government on the tech side? Yeah, it's been incredibly exciting to watch the response to the, of the tech community. First off, to sort of the beginning of this wave, which started with uh, the health care of rescue and, and uh, the presidential innovation fellows. It actually started early with the president's leadership on having a CTO at all right. uh, embedded in, in uh, the Office of Science Technology Policy with Dr. Holder and the president's incredible science advisor who I get to work with and that team. Um, so ha that leadership and that shift is going on. And so as the call is going out and we're talking about it, people are responding. And also the leadership it, certainly in the White House and throughout government are quite open to this group coming and really trying to understand how to let us execute things in the way we would bring to government, which was great. Uh, a lot of senior, fo more senior folks have been coming. One of my favorite things is really a lot of the early Amazon team has been joining us. Uh, the number three employee of Amazon is in the VA as an extraordinary engineering manager. What, I mean, what's your second act after you make Amazon? <laughs> It'll be the American veterans. Like that is an amazing thing. It's an honor to get to work on helping them and making their world better. And can we bring that level of quality right. that Jeff and the team at Amazon have brought to their products and their mobile products, all of their products, and the customer experience and the customer focus and the customer design to something you would make from the IRS, from the VA, from immigration, and that the quality of our interactions with the American people would go up so much, much more because we're not disintermediated from, from sort of forms being digitized, but by really terrific customer experiences. So I think people are very attracted by that idea and want to come and see if we can make it so. It's, it's a, almost like a startup, and yet it's right. a huge heavy lift because it's a, it's a multi-hundred-year-old awesome <laughs> startup. It's not uh, something that's new. Right. Uh, it's new maybe in a digital way because of the way computer systems are, but 
I mean, George Washington started the Army Corps of Engineers prior to the start of the country. And uh, if you look at them, they wear this really cool symbol. It it's looks like a fort. It's actually Bunker Fort for the first thing they built uh, supporting the Continental Army. So, you know, we have this great history at various moments. We're just best in tech, and that's what we're trying to do now. So when there is so much competition um, in the private sector and all over the world, frankly, for high tech talent, what is, what's your sales pitch to get people to come to the government? Right, actually there's five million jobs open in the US right now and half a million of them are in tech. It's the largest chunk because there's just such a need. And so we've been doing a lot of work just to onboard more people. You know, the, 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 the community, the tech community has innovated code boot camps. Right. And all these short course uh, apprentice like training models, which are fabulous and getting the word out about those and getting more people in. So that's one piece, which is just supporting our programs through Department of Labor and other and city programs to help uh, local businesses who are starving for this talent to grow our economy, be able to get them faster. So in addition to the classic four-year or two-year degree, they will continue to hire for, there's just not enough of those people. And so making sure there's these other tracks. And so you see St. Louis and Louisville and uh, New York City and uh, Philly and, um, Albuquerque, these country getting together, that was our tech hire initiative, whitehouse.gov slash tech hire uh, on the gov. So that's going on. So build the, build the capacity of more people being able to do this, whether it's cyber, product management, user interface, coding, all these cool jobs. And it's fun jobs. They pay 50% more than the average American salary. So more people in. And then for, for us also as a customer of that as government, we can't pay the same salaries as, say, a venture-backed company. But it's, if you think of it as a tour of duty, that it's one of the great uh, sort of honors to get right. to serve your country. Our country will only be as good as all of us showing up <laughs> to help the government uh, be as great as it could be or in the, in the philosophy and the spirit and the values that we want it to have as well as the capacity that we need it to have. And thinking about it as a rotation like military service uh, or judicial court <laughs> clerking or uh, the science fellows in coming for periods of time. And so the United States Digital Service is structured for both full-time and part-time. And actually, Secretary Carter uh, just uh, is opening an uh, innovation center in Moffitt um, out in Silicon Valley, uh, which will allow for, when I worked at, at Google, and this is true of a lot of tech companies, the veterans who are working there often have security clearances and would love to continue to serve through the reserves. And they don't have a tech option like some countries like Israel and others have. And so this gives us that option, especially helpful for cyber. Um, but anything. And then on the 18F team, which is part of the USDS, that's sort of an in, internal web dev back end front end shop, mm -hmm. they actually have offices across from Twitter in uh, UN Plaza in San Francisco, they're nice. in Chicago, they're in Ohio, they're in, I think, Texas, they're in a lot of places, New York City, as well as here in DC. So really taking advantage of talent all over the country and hopefully wherever there's a GSA office, there should be a way that an 18F person should be able to work there. So let's talk about cultivating new talent, and, and that kind of gets into a little bit, you know, of, of diversity. And both, you know, the tech industry and I would say, you know, Washington are not the most diverse places. You know, it tends to be a, a lot of, of, of straight white men. And how do we get more women and minorities involved, both in tech and, and, and um, in policy, and ideally both? Mm -hmm. I, the good news is it's starting to shift, which is good. Um, there's a, a kind of a, an amazing list of extraordinary companies. We were talking about um, the CNBC disruptors yes. list. And, uh, you know, wonderful companies on there disrupting all kinds of things from, you know, brilliant new ways, to sustainable ways in food and interesting transportation, energy. A lot of Mark Andreessen's software eat the world, eats the world yes. companies where software plus some other plays are coming in. Most of them are like that. The thing that's disappointing about the list, which is not really CNBC's issue, it's the it's the venture issue. Right. Uh, I think only three women as CEOs, founders are in the list, and maybe one African American person. And that's the crazy thing. Yeah. If you think about it, from the talent of our country and unlocking it, the well, problem I mean, is venture tracks exactly to those numbers. I right. think it's three percent venture money goes to women, and less than one percent goes to African Americans. So. We're getting, you know, the talent is lifting at the exact rate it's getting funded. And so we just need to really work on all the unconscious bias and, that's out there to try to help people uh, get the money they deserve who have extraordinary ideas and are already working on them. They're just not able to raise the money in those ways or get access to the same uh, networks that others are, have access to. 
I, I read a study, and I think this is accurate. I might get the figures a little bit wrong, but I believe that it was in 1984, 40% uh, percent of computer science graduates were women, and now I think it's something like like 18 percent. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's it it varies. Some of it is single digit, and some of it is you know into the teens and 20s. Right. There's a few schools who've broken through. Harvey Mudd, I think, is nearing right. in the 40s. But but the fact that over 30 years, mm -hmm. we've seen this precipitous drop, this 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 huge decline. Um, meanwhile, um, uh, tech literacy, digital literacy, is more important than ever. STEM mm -hmm. is more important than ever. What can we do um, to get more women involved and in, in, in parts of these programs, or even if they don't need, if they don't want to graduate with a CS degree, more involved in, in these sorts of skills? Because it is so important. Like you said, half a million of, of the available jobs are, are, are in the tech field, and if we've got fewer women coming out of this than we had you know, 30 years ago, there's a problem. Yeah, we're not using all the talent of our country. Right. And that's a mistake. It's a mistake on many fronts. It's a mistake in general and also uh, from all of the studies show Catalyst, McKinsey, other studies show that the more diverse your team, just the better your products are. Same thing as your financial performance as a company. It's just better if you have a diverse team. The, uh, the, there's a lot of things that happen, but one of them is just deep unconscious bias. So as we got computers in the person computer space, we sort of gave them to our boys. I have a friend who she had to go get a key to unlock her brother's room to go code. Like we wow. just had this systemic behavior. Um, today in children and families television, if there's a computer scientist who's drawn in an animation or acted, 15 to 1 it's cast as a boy or a man. So Hollywood doesn't mean to be biased in that way. But they're doing it. They're doing the same thing with race and gender. It's, it's out of every four characters in general on children's TV, only one is a girl. Right. Uh, in STEM, one out of five. But computer science, 15 to one. So when children and when we watch TV, you can see that that matters out of a lot of different ones. But one of my favorite ones is CSI. Mm -hmm. Like forensics is off the chart on women trying to study forensics. It's incredibly interesting. It's depicted in scripted media as this interesting thing. And it's cast with women. So uh, we get these biases that come from media around us. You know, I'm excited for the new Star Wars. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to note how many women are in six movies yes. of Star Wars, a two. <laughs> and so, you know, that has affected the Lego Corporation, right? Because now all their cool Star Wars stuff are not pulling for girls in right. the same way. And it just, it just, it snowballs everywhere. So that visibility, also the companies can be doing more work of making sure people are on stage. The people are there. There's 16 million programmers in the world. It means there are two to three million women programmers in the world. They can be on stage. Just go find them, do the extra work. So I think it's part of it is putting this stuff into our short list on the priorities and working our biases and just getting it done. Um, when we decide to do things as a tech industry, we are very good at it. And I don't think we've decided at a priority one, two, three level to get this done. And so if we did that, I think uh, we'd be in a very different position right now, and I think we can be in a short number of years if we set the priority higher. We're starting to see some of it from the companies, but uh, it's just the beginning, and I really encourage all of them to just upgrade the prioritization. Lou Gerstner did it with IBM, and it made a big difference in the 90s, and so it's a proven thing that works. Do you think it'll be a generational thing? Do you think that we can make it more of a priority for, for you know, coming up generations? Or do you think this is something, uh, how, how do we make this a bigger priority? I, I guess that's what I'm asking. I think there's three, three different areas. There's the K-12 work or pre-K little kids work. There's very specific things to do. We know that the more they try it, the more they understand, oh, this isn't hard, this is fun. Right. You know? We know that it takes grit you know, to be able to get, write a great essay takes grit. So kids should know that. And so they need visibility that people have always been there doing this work, which they have. Women are some of the inventors of computers. Yes. It was just uh, down the street at the patent and trade um, event for the new inductees. And um, it was great because uh, <coughs> Charles Drew family was there. And he was being inducted, um, you know, the inventor of blood banking. African-American man who uh, you know, has saved so many lives with his inventions. A lot of people don't know about him. There's so many people like him, Ada Lovelace and the ENIAC programmers. And you know, even if you saw Imitation Game, yes. uh, Joan Clark with Turing, she's real. And we noted, I actually had a conversation with the president about this, um, about the film, because Prince William had just left the Oval when we were going to the computer science work with uh, for Computer Science Education Week when he was coding. And I said, there's a connection, Mr. President, uh, and it is that uh, William's uh, wife, Kate's grandmother, was a code breaker at Bletchley Park. And wow. Most people don't know that. And, you know, two thirds of the people at Bletchley were women. Uh, not women clerking, of course, there were women clerking, but women mathematicians who were, you know, saving 
11 million lives shortening the world by two years, which is what Brett Bletchley did. People don't know those stories, so they don't see that future in the past that is true. So we need to make that true. Uh, I think that would help many people. So the K-12, there's the university work, Harvey Mudd and others are changing how we teach and it's working, so people should look into that. And then at the corporate level, advancement and retention. We just lose so many people all the time. And the unconscious bias, death by a thousand paper cuts, is like crushing us. And that's where we have to really get our act together and just have the will to prioritize it and just systemically work through it and debug the problem like we know how to do with almost any problem in the tech sector. We just have to have the will. Last question. Yeah. Do you think that your, the policy changes, and the, the changes you're making right now um, it, w with the government, will they survive a regime change? You know, I, it's, it's such good practice to be including these kinds of innovation techniques. It's not partisan. Um, one thing we will do next year is uh, we hope to reach out to every campaign and just make sure that everybody who's running knows about the work we're doing so they can think about how they might include it. I think that would be a good best practice. Um, and we'll understand from lawyers how we do that and, and what, what's allowed there because we're new around here. Um, but, uh, but I think it's important. It's so important for the American people. The American people deserve an extraordinary government. And we have one, we're just sort of like limping around on a couple of the tech sides and we can, we're can we upgrading that now and we want to keep that and accelerate it. Uh, the other thing I love working on also is how do you get more Americans in on the innovation economy itself all over our country, all people. Uh, so some of my favorite stuff we work on is not only the digital government stuff, but things like in Baltimore, <coughs> extraordinary folks who are doing things like Digital Harbor Foundation. They took rec centers and they call it rec to tech. And this all over the city, they're working on having a maker space and this so everyone gets to learn and get exposed to this and learn how fun it is, whether you want to be a coder or whether you have just a cool project that you want to do. And back to your first question and on diversity, one of the other things that's been so fabulous in the president's team is that it's the most diverse team I've ever worked on. And it's just incredible talent altogether. So, to all our techies listening, I encourage you to come come join us because it's a pretty amazing honor to get to doing it. It's fun. Hear that, techies? Join oh. the government. <laughs> <laughs> we want you. <laughs> Megan, thank you so much. Sure, thanks for having me.